Hi guys, welcome back to my channel. My name is Suranjali Seal and like I always say, if you are somebody that loves literature and is all about literature, then this is the channel for you. In our video today, we're going to begin our discussion on the life and works of Sir Philip Sidney. Now, you know, if you have been following my videos, you would know we finished the Greek critics. We're covering literary criticism, right? So we've completed Socrates, Aristotle and Plato who fall under the Greek critics, which we are supposed to study as literature students. So we've completed the Greek critics and now we're moving on further from that. Today we're going to begin our discussion on the life and works of Sir Philip Sidney which I have divided into three videos. So this is the first video where I'm going to cover his life. Uh, we're going to cover the basic facts about his life. What is he remembered for? What are the events in his life? What are the turning points in his life up until his death? And in the next video which I'm going to upload, I'm going to talk about his works. We're going to cover the facts like for example i'm just giving an example we're going to cover say the date of publications the summary of the works the name of the works uh, what inspired him when did he write the works when did he start when did he finish all of those things we're going to talk about in the next video and in the third and last video we are going to devote our time to studying an apology for poetry which is what we have to concern ourselves with as far as literary criticism is concerned so without any further ado let's get right into it Okay, so let's look at the introduction. Let us see. This is the introduction. So we're going to look at a roundabout, uh, you know, overview of why uh, Philip Sidney is important and what is he remembered for. So let's have a look at the introduction. Sir Philip Sidney was an English poet, courtier, soldier and scholar who is remembered as one of the most prominent figures of the Elizabethan age. His works include a sonnet sequence, Astrophel and Stella is the name, a treatise, The Defense of Poesy, also known as an apology for poetry, this is the name, and a pastoral romance, The Countess of Pembroke's Arcadia, this is the name. So see, in this introduction, what is the takeaway? What do we have to remember from this introduction? First, that he was one of the most prominent figures of the Elizabethan era. Now, if you haven't watched my video on the history of the Elizabethan era, or if you've not watched the characteristics of Elizabethan age and my Renaissance video, make sure you do so because like I've time and again stressed on the fact that whatever the background, the surrounding, the society in which these writers lived did have an impact on their sensibilities. So if you have an idea of the times to which they belong to, then their works will be easier to understand. I have given the example in, uh, I think it was my Edmund Spencer video, where I had given the example of a journal, right? That why, what do we write in a journal? Our day's experience, our thoughts, our feelings, we write that in the journal. Now, you know, we live in the 21st century, everything around us, the surroundings, the trends, you know, the laws, the, the way the world is working right now has an impact on our mind, on our sensibilities, on the way that we think, on our opinions and the way that we lead our life. So that's why all the generations and all the writers differ from each other because they belong to different time periods. So my point is, that if you know the background, if you know the Elizabethan era, for example, if you know what the Renaissance was all about, then you will know what Philip Sidney or where Philip Sidney came from. You will understand his sensibilities because all of these things were reflected in his works as well. And that goes for all the other writers across generations as well. So a background check is absolutely necessary. And that is why as students of literature, our teachers always stress that we have to do or know the background. We have to do a background check. We have to know the background in order to understand the writers, their sensibilities and their works a little better. So he was one of the most prominent figures of the Elizabethan age. He was a poet. We all know that he was a courtier, part of the court. That means um, um, he was a prominent figure in the court as well. So that means he did have connections. Then he was a scholar and he was a soldier. Now there's a famous legend and myth and story behind his death. He died on the battlefield. So we covered this aspect of Philip Sidney's life towards the end of this video. So please do stay tuned. Now from the literary perspective, what are the takeaways? From the literary perspective, we have to know that he wrote a sonnet sequence and the name of the sonnet sequence is Astrophel and Stella. 
Then he wrote a treatise. The name of the treatise is A Defense of Poesy or An Apology for Poetry, which we are going to cover in the third video of Sir Philip Sidney in detail. So this is a treatise that he had written and he had also written a pastoral romance. These three are the works that he is remembered for. Of course, he wrote other works as well, which we are going to do in the next video. But these three are the ones that he is remembered for. They, they were uh, a milestone in the history of uh, English literature, in the history of um, uh, literature literary criticism also. So this is what he wrote. Now what is the next thing that as literary students we are supposed to do? We have to find out the meaning of these words, right? We have to know what is a sonnet sequence, we have to know what is a treatise, we have to know the meaning of a pastoral romance. So let's just have a look at these three words and find these three words, sonnet sequence, um, uh, treatise and pastoral romance. Let's have a look at these words and what they mean and what importance do they hold in the uh, in in the world of literary terms. Okay, so let's have a look at the sonnet sequence. What is the name of the sonnet sequence that uh, Sir Philip Sidney wrote? Astrophel and Stella. So we all know what a sonnet is. But what is a sonnet sequence? A sonnet sequence is a group of sonnets. Of course, you can understand it by the name. It's a sequence, one after the other. So it's a group of sonnets clubbed together. But there's a catch. Thematically clubbed together. Thematically unified to create a long work. So you've written sonnets. Say you've written 30 sonnets, just for example. All of these 30 sonnets are in connection with one another. Sonnet 1 will be connected to sonnet 2. Sonnet 2 to sonnet 3 and so on and so forth and together you compile them and they become a work. Now these sonnets will follow a theme, say like we follow a plot line right in a story. So there will be a particular theme which is constant in this sonnet, in these sonnets okay that you have compiled together. But there's also catch. The beauty of sonnet sequences lies in the fact that they can be read as individual sonnets also. So you can read say sonnet 1 and then uh, in relation to sonnet 1 you read sonnet 2, sonnet 3, sonnet 4. You go on with reading these sonnets okay. But suppose you have no idea of Astrophel and Stella and you just randomly pick up sonnet 3 and you're like I'll read sonnet 3 today it will still make sense. Even if you don't know the theme, even if you don't know what happened in Sonnet 2 and Sonnet 1, Sonnet 3 will still make sense to you. So the beautif beauty of these sonnet sequences is that you can read them together as a work or you can also read them singly, individually and you'll still enjoy them. So this is the beauty of sonnet sequences and the one that Sir Philip Sidney wrote is Astrophel and Stella. Next, we have to know what do we mean by a treatise. The treatise that he wrote and which we are going to discuss in detail is the defense of poetry or uh, an apology for poetry or the defense of poesy. So what is a treatise? What do we mean by a treatise? A treatise is a formal and systematic written discourse on some subject. So what is the subject that he's talking about? It's a formal written discourse or systematic written discourse on some subject. It's a systematic way, a formal way that he has addressed and written on a, uh, written about a subject. The subject matter here for him, as far as apology for poetry is concerned, is poetry. So he's written, writing about this particular subject matter and it is concerned with investigating or exposing the principles of the subject and its, conclus and its conclusions. So what he's doing here, he is dealing with investigating what poetry is, exposing the characteristics of poetry. And then he's also trying to talk about the principles of the subject, what characterizes poetry and then he's going to draw conclusions from that. So what is a sonnet sequence? A sonnet sequence is a sequence of sonnets that can be read together or singly or also and a treatise is a formal discourse on a particular subject you will draw conclusions towards the end last but not the least we have to know what is a pastoral romance now when you know you i think you've heard of the word pasture pasture okay i'll just give an example we all know what a pasture is whenever we think about a pasture if somebody talks about uh, have you seen a pasture the immediate image that comes to your mind is of cows grazing on the field, an open green land or grassland or a farmland. That's what you think about when you, that's the image that comes to your mind when you think of a pasture. From that, that is similar to the word pastoral, right? And that pastoral is exactly that. A pastoral, there's a difference between a pastoral and a pastoral romance. A pastoral is a genre of literature, art or music. So pastoral has branched out to these different uh, art forms also. So you have the pastoral genre of literature, art or music depicts an idealized form of the shepherd's lifestyle. 
okay so basically the countryside and herding livestock around open areas of land according to the seasons changing availability of water and pasture the target audience is typically an urban one okay so the target audience is the urban uh, is an urban one so you're writing keeping in mind the audience uh, uh, urban audience so you kind of in uh, induce or incite feelings of how country life is simple how that is the life you should strive for how there are not that many complex how you're so closely connected with nature these are the ideas that you actually strive for when it comes to pastoral a pastoral okay but when it comes to a pastoral romance there's a slight difference not that much of a difference but a slight that it is it was invented it was an innovation by the italian writers later it was of course taken up by um uh, uh, European writers also. So Italian writers um, uh, uh, invented a new genre, the pastoral romance, and which mixed pastoral poems with a fictional narrative in prose. So you're writing a pastoral uh, poem, okay, you mix the pastoral poem with fictional narrative. So pastoral is about the countryside, romance is a love story. So it's basically fictional narrative. So it's a love story that takes place in the countryside, a pastoral romance. And the Countess of Pembroke's Arcadia is the classic example of a pastoral romance, of a pastoral romance. So this is what you have to understand. What is a pastoral in literature and the difference between a pastoral and a pastoral romance. So a pastoral, like I said, idealizes country life. Pastoral romances, same thing. It's just that it's a love story. It covers a love story. Okay. So this is what you have to know about these three, um, these words. I think that it's very important to understand these words. These form and un these fall under literary uh, terms, right? Which we also have to cover. So this is what we mean by a sonnet sequence. This is what we mean by a treatise, and this is what we mean by a pastoral romance. Now we're going to start with the life of Sir Philip Sidney, right from his birth up till uh, up until his death. So. Let's get right into it. Okay, so let's have a look at some basic facts. So he was born in Kent of an aristocratic family. What is the takeaway? That he was born to an aristocratic family. So he knew right from birth what are the ways of the court, what is the way of an aristocratic life. He knows, um, uh, he knows wealth, he knows power, and he's also exposed to the court life. So that again will reflect in his writings. So the takeaway over here is not simply that he was born in Kent. The takeaway here is that he was born to an aristocratic family and that, that everything about somebody's life will have an impact on their um, uh, personality, on their characteristics, on their traits and understanding of the world as well. So he was born of an aristocratic family. His sister Mary was um, a writer, translator and literary patron. So you see you already have somebody in the house who is a literary patron. She is a writer. In those times, in the Elizabethan era, knowledge was flourishing and she a woman at that time was a writer, a translator and literary patron. So she was the patron of the arts, patron of literature and this he witnessed, he was a part of it. It was his sibling who was doing all of this. So therefore he must have had some kind of influence from her. She must have influenced him also to a greater uh, greater extent. So what I'm trying to say is that you look at his surroundings. These surroundings have contributed to making him who he is also. So he has his sister Mary. She was a writer, translator and literary patron. She married Henry Herbert, second Earl of Pembroke. Now, you remember the Countess of Pembroke's Arcadia. You will understand this now. Why is Why are these facts about Sydney's life important? Because they're closely connected to his works. Okay, so she married Henry Herbert. Who was Henry Herbert? He was the second Earl of Pembroke. Okay, after her brother's death, that is after Sydney's death, Mary reworked the Arcadia. Sydney had written the Arcadia. Then he had passed away after her brother's death, after the, Sydney's death. She had again reworked the Arcadia. She worked on the Arcadia, reworked it, which became known as the Countess of Pembroke's Arcadia. So today we know it as the Countess of Pembroke's Arcadia because Mary is the one who reworked it. So Sydney had written Arcadia. Mary had uh, married the Earl of Pembroke. So she becomes what? The Countess of Pembroke, right? Then after Sydney's death, she reworks the Arcadia and now we know it as the Countess of Pembroke's Arcadia. That is Mary's Arcadia. So she had reworked the Arcadia 
at the age of 18, Sydney traveled to France as part. So you see, the embassy and all of this is not really important. He traveled to France. That is important. He spent the next several years in mainland Europe. That is important. He, he was moving through Germany, Italy, Poland and the Kingdom of Hungary and Austria. This is important. Why? Because you see, he's adding diversity to his knowledge of the world. He's not concentrated in one place. He's exposing himself to these different places in the world. Okay, so he's going to Germany, he's going to Italy, he's going to Poland, he's going to Hungary and Austria. And what is he doing there? Gathering experiences. And all of this, again, will reflect in the works. So on these travels, he met a number of prominent European intellectuals and politicians. So he had reach. And conversations with these people, conversations and exposition to these people, their different opinions, their lives, their views of the world will give him a lot of insight into the diversity of our world, right? Into the way uh, our views differ. It will add to his body of knowledge. So that is why all of these things are important. Returning to England in 1575, Sidney met Penelope. So this is his love interest. So her father, Walter Devereux, first Earl of Essex, was said to have planned to marry his daughter to Sydney. So her father, Walter, was supposed to marry his daughter, that is Penelope, to Sydney. But he had passed away in um, uh, 1576 and that marriage did not take place. So again, why is this important? Why is Penelope important? Why? Because he had written Astrophel and Stella. And the inspiration for Stella came from Penelope. So although much younger, she inspired his famous sonnet sequence of the 80, 1580s, Astrophel and Stella. In England, Sidney occupied himself with politics and art. Sidney played a brilliant part in the military, literary, courtly life common to the young nobles of the time. So he actually took part in everything that was noble. Uh, everything that is uh, uh, courtly, everything that is aristocratic, things that he has been used to his whole life, he took part actively in politics and art. Now, in 1586, um, uh, he joined Sir Norris. So, he ba basically went to the Battle of Zutphen. So, some people say Zutphen, some people say Zutphen. So, uh, I'm going to pronounce it as Zutphen. So, he had go uh, taken part in the Battle of Zutphen, fighting for the Protestant uh, cause against the Spanish. So, he had been he, he fought here on a, uh, one account says that here's where he died okay in the battle of uh, Zatfin so one account says this that his death was avoidable and heroic Sidney noticed that one of his men was not fully armored he took off his thigh armor on grounds that it would be wrong to be better armored than his men so when you go to war you have an armor that you're wearing right so he took off his thigh armor because he did not want to be better armored than his men so it's kind of like he wanted to establish that equal grounds okay with his fellow men who are also working with him for the same cause and as he lay dying Sidney composed a song to be sung by his deathbed so uh, according to the story while lying wounded this is the most famous one I think most of us know it also um, he gave his water to another wounded soldier saying thy necessity is yet greater than mine so you know he sacrificed his well-being he actually thought about the other person first he was chivalric enough and hu humane enough to actually not think about himself and give his uh, water to another wounded soldier who was laying by him and this is why he is celebrated as the Castiglione Cotia. Now, I have to, you know, why I'm saying this, you have to understand why I give you the background to Sydney's life. So, everything, the fact that he belonged to an aristocratic family, the fact that he had the chivalry around him, this humanistic quality about him, the fact that he was able to think about somebody else before him. The, the, all of those things surround this character of a Castiglione um, uh, courtier. So you have to know, he is known as the perfect example of the Castiglione um, courtier. So who is a Castiglione courtier? Okay, you have to know the definition. So this is what the book of the courtier. This is a book that has been written by Baldessa. Castiglione in a, it is a lengthy philosophical dialogue on the topic of what constitutes an ideal courtier. So there's a book, the uh, book of the courtier. In it, Castiglione, his writer, he has discussed, it's a philosophical discourse. He tells us what should be the qualities of an ideal courtier. Based on this, 
Sydney has gotten the tag of an ideal courtier. He ha has gotten the tag of uh, the Castiglione uh, courtier because of the way he has lived his life, because of uh, the, all these stories that surround his life. He was the perfect Castiglione courtier. So if there's a question that is asked, who um, in literature is known as the Castiglione courtier, it is Phil Sir Philip Sidney because of the way he has lived his life, because of all of these acts that he has uh, 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 performed, the, her the, the heroic acts, the chivalric acts, the the humane side to his persona all of that so he is not just a courtier he's not just a soldier but he's you know like sort of the complete package so uh, uh, the ideal courtier figure moved towards a more humanistic ideal requiring him not only to have traditional chivalric qualities like you know not like okay i'll open the car door for you today not not only those things not just those things but also intellectual prowess so intellectually also you have to have that kind of insight and it is reflected through his works it is reflected through his discourse his travels the kind of people he associated with and also the way he led his life so that is why you have to remember this this is all about his life now we're going to go to the last slide which will cover all the aspects about his death and after Okay, so guys, this is the last slide for today. We're going to look at the death of Sir Philip Sidney and what happened after. So Sidney's body, okay, in 1587, Sidney's body was returned to London and placed in old St. Paul's Cathedral. The grave and monument were destroyed in the Great Fire of London in 1666. A modern monument in the crypt lists his among the important graves lost. So see, this is not complicated at all. There is a history that we have to understand and we just go through it very shortly crisply and very easily so see they said that his body was placed in the old saint paul's cathedral so naturally it is not the saint paul's cathedral which we are talking of today there was an old saint paul cathedral and this cathedral was burned in the great fire of london in 1666 it got burned in place of it today is saint paul's cathedral stands okay so what happened here the old um, St. Paul's Cathedral stood uh, at the site of the present St. Paul's Cathedral. It was built from 1087 to 1314 and dedicated to St. Paul. So, see, this is the timeline. A church is there. This church burns down. Then you have the old St. Paul Cathedral, which is constructed. It takes 200 years to construct this old St. Paul's Cathedral. Again, St. Paul's Cathedral burns down because of the Great Fire in London. Then they construct another church in its place and it is the present day St. Paul's Cathedral. Okay, so what happens again? I'll just repeat. Church burns down, old St. Paul's Cathedral is constructed, old St. Paul's Cathedral burns down, then you have the present day St. Paul's Cathedral. Okay, so work on the cathedral began after a fire in 1087, which destroyed the previous church. Work took more than 200 years. Over that time, the architecture of the church changed from Norman Romanesque to early English Gothic. So the church before had this Nor uh, Romanesque architecture, Norman Romanesque. By Romanesque, I mean, remember Greek architecture had talked about how there were big pillars supporting, uh, uh, supporting the roof. There were archways and, you know, everything. If you look at Roman architecture, you'll understand that is what characterized the church. But when this uh, old St. Paul's Cathedral was, uh, was being worked on, those 200, that 200 years, it changed from Romanesque to Gothic, English Gothic. And again, Gothic, I have talked about in my video on what is Gothic literature. I've discussed it there. I've discussed Gothic architecture also. So in Gothic architecture, you don't have archways like this. You have pointed archways. You have complete pointed archways. You have extensions of the building. You can see it even in the picture. You have extensions in the buildings. If you have watched movies enough, you will. If you, you remember some movies depict gargoyles uh, sitting arch, uh, outside the arch outside the cathedral the extensions on the ceiling in the carnishes also you will have um, gargoyles placed and all of that those kind of extensions so you know you have pointed arches and then the architecture is such of gothic okay so this is the difference between romanesque and early gothic uh, english gothic architecture so if you look at the church right now the arches are very pointed and everything so that is english gothic so the cathedral was in structural decline uh, over the centuries there are many uh, challenges that it faced during the civil english civil war also construction was halted uh, you know repair work had begun but it was halted during the english civil war over centuries there was repair work uh, being done to conserve of it but there was a great fire of london that broke out 
it is it probably started from a bakery a bake the fire started from the bakery and then it spread okay like it was uncontrollable and it spread like wildfire throughout um, uh, London through a greater part of London so in the great fire of London we lost the old St. Paul's Cathedral it was burnt down and then the present uh, St. Paul's Cathedral stands in it um, in its place today so in the in that fire even Sydney's grave was lost so you know a modern monument in the crypt uh, lists his among the important graves lost. So they lost his grave. So in today's St. Paul's Cathedral in the crypt, a crypt is a cellar or a vault in the underground chamber. So you have the church, there's an underground chamber. You'll see it in movies. Many movies depict this, uh, especially those uh, uh, those coming out of the West. So you'll have many movies where, where they depict that there's this church and then you have an underground vault and chamber. So there you actually have a chapel, either you have a chapel or you have a, a burial place. It is a burial place for the dead. So in that crypt in today's St. Paul's uh, Cathedral, uh, there's this modern, modern mo monument which lists that uh, like Sydney's grave as one of the graves that were lost. So Sydney's grave was lost in the old uh, uh, fire of London and a modern monument in the crypt lists his among the important graves lost. So this is what you have to know about his death. Now see, already during his own lifetime, but even more after his death because of the way he died and the story surrounding his death he had become for many English people the very epitome of a Castiglione um, uh, courtier learned and politic but at the same time generous brave and impulsive so this is what a Castiglione uh, courtier is all about and Philip Sidney embodied all these qualities now this with this we're done with his life okay but there are some important things you have to remember as far as uh, literature is concerned so even in my um, um, Edmund Spencer video I had talked about how Edmund Spencer did meet Sydney how uh, Sydney did have an influence uh, on him so you have to remember this over here that Sydney was memorialized as the flower of English or the flower of English uh, manhood in Edmund Spencer's Astrophel so he was actually memorialized as the flower of English manhood in Edmund Spencer's Astrophel he wrote Sydney wrote Astrophel and Stella Edmund Spencer wrote Astrophel and he was memor memorialized as the flower of English manhood, the epitome of being the ideal uh, or the epitome of uh, English manhood in Astrophel by Spencer, uh, one of the greatest English Renaissance elegies. So Astrophel is an elegy. I talked about this in my Edmund Spencer video. He wrote an elegy on the death of Sir Philip Sidney and here he has memorialized um, Sir Philip Sidney as the flower of English manhood. So the elegy which Sir uh, Edmund Spencer had written on uh, uh, Sir Philip Sidney's death is called Astrophel. So you have to remember this. Next, Spencer dedicated his shepherd's calendar to Sydney. So I've also discussed this in, in my Edmund Spencer video. So now I think it'll be very clear for you all. And with this, we're done with Sir Philip Sidney's life. We've covered all the important aspects of his life and as far as literature is concerned. So in the next video, I'm going to continue to talk about uh, his uh, works. And in the third video, like I said, I'm going to cover an apology for poetry in detail. So till we meet again, I really hope that you stay happy and healthy. If this video has been helpful for you then please do like the video share the video and subscribe to my channel for similar content i feel that life is only getting more complicated day by day and uh, we've always had a thing for control as human beings so i just wanted to put it out there that i wish you all the positivity in life i feel like there's a lot of time to brood a lot of time to take tensions the only thing that we want in life is control but the truth about life is that we have no control whatsoever so the only thing that we can do as human beings is live in the moment Moment. whatever we have to do is invest time and effort in what we're doing right now so that we can make something out of what's going to come next so i really hope that you hold on there i hope that you stay healthy happy positive and um, as tension free as possible and uh, see you in the next one guys